Good morning, church. I'm sure as you reflect on your own personal uh, history within church life, there are people whom you've met uh, that you desire to imitate. People whom, um, to you, reflect the love of Christ. They are kind, considerate, caring, generous, encouraging, honest, loving, never boasting in themselves, but in in Christ alone. They are humble, gentle, patient, gracious, and merciful, and, and much, much, much more worthy brothers and sisters that look like Jesus. And then I'm sure that you've met some people that aren't so much that way, or opposite at times. Well, in John's letter this morning, in 3 John here, he ends up uh, contrasting these two types of people within church life. Uh, his letters before, 1 and 2 John, uh, he, he's more concerned with theological truth versus theological error. And while he is still concerned with such matters, still concerned with theological truth, uh, he is also recognizing that someone might preach theological truth and yet prone to sin and selfish and unloving tendencies as we will see in this epistle of 3 John. And in, in this epistle, in this letter, 3 John, and so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there, we have three examples of people within church life. Two are worthy of our imitation as they imitate Christ, and the other, well, not so much. So let's, we'll look at each of these three individuals separately. So first, let's look at our first one here by the name of Gaius. And so follow along with me as I read uh, verses 1 to 8 to begin of 3 John. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, still to Gaius, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Now, Right off the bat, we see John's main concern satisfied in Gaius. Gaius is a person of the truth. Four times in these first four verses, John mentions truth. He loves him in the truth, and he hears that Gaius is teaching and walking in the truth, and this brings him great joy as we see in verse 4. And and John, being a spiritual father to Gaius, rejoices greatly that one of the individuals he saw come to the faith is still walking in and practicing the truth. Still following Jesus. And I know many of you that have had the privilege of being a, a spiritual mother or a spiritual father to either your kids or someone else Rejoice greatly in this reality as well. And I know for some of you that you may have your own kids that are not walking in the truth. I know that this is a great pain otherwise. But for the the younger ones we know that are striving to work out their faith with, with fear and trembling, we rejoice as John does here. And as I look back upon my my 14 years of of youth ministry, it indeed brings me great joy uh, to see someone that I've interacted with in one way or another uh, 
live out their faith in Jesus, to be imitators of Jesus. And I hope the best for them, both body and soul, as John does Gaius. And there in verse 2, praying that it would go well with him, with his health, in body, and with his soul, as it is with his soul. He wishes for an overall well-being for Gaius, and naturally so. We are allowed to pray that it would go well with people in such ways. We are allowed to pray for, for good health for individuals. We are not Gnostics, which again John writes to in his first epistle. We are not Gnostics rejecting the body. We value the body. We are body and soul individuals. Nevertheless, uh, we, we must emphasize that a healthy body without a healthy soul makes for an unhealthy person. And so, while so many in the church are concerned with their physical health, as is the movement of culture and society as a whole, we must also consider the health of our souls. Are our souls well too? So John, be well, friends, Gaius, both body and soul. And what an encouragement Gaius is. He is spiritually well, living out the truth of God. And the brothers that John sent to him uh, and the church reported back wonderful things about Gaius, testifying to this truth that he is living out. His word and his deeds align together. Love and truth for him go together, which we looked at last week. They are matching up. He talks the talk and walks the walk. Something we wish would be true of more Christians, probably. He is worthy of imitation. And we see this more specifically in, in these next verses uh, through Gai Gaius' generosity. Again, verses 5 to 8 again. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all, all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are. These strangers who testified to your love before the church. It goes on. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. So, therefore, we ought to support people like these. That we may be fellow workers for the truth. In verse 5 here, John recounts and praises Gaius' generosity. Which took place in the form of hospitality. Gaius took in these strangers because they were brothers going on for the, for the name of Christ. And then in verse 6 and 8 we see John exhorts Gaius and all Christians continu to continue to do the same in their support for people advancing the gospel. Be hospitable to these people. Generous. Send them on their journey in a worthy manner. In a manner worthy of God. Pay for their ticket to travel. Buy their gas. Give them some money for food as they go. Are some of the things that we might say about these things today. People, brothers and sisters, strangers as they are, to us are worthy of the church's support if their motivation is the same as ours. If they're exalting the name of Christ above all things. They are not out here trying to, to be famous or, or rich, but they are making much of Christ. Again, it might be different than who John's addressing last week. They were not like the, great, the other great orators of the day who, who demanded payment after they gave a lecture. You know, they would pass the hat for their own sake. Because they're such great speakers. They weren't doing it for the mission of Christ. Yet in verse 7, it uh, mentions something honorable. They didn't take money from the Gentiles, these individuals. Meaning, they didn't take money from unbelievers. They didn't go around speaking and then pass the collection plate to, to these Gentiles, to these non-Christians, hoping that they would pay their way. 
if an unbelieving person wanted to open his wallet after a gospel message, these men would refuse their pay. They weren't like these Greek or Roman orators. These Greek or Roman sophists. They wanted to be sure the message of Christ they had to offer was given freely. No strings attached. It's a free gift of grace. You don't have to pay for it. And so, John says to Gaius, continue your work to support people like this. These missionaries doing the work of God among the nations. So that, verse 8, we might be fellow workers in this truth. For the truth. We partner for the sake of the gospel. To advance it in the world around us. God invites us to be be venture capitalists in the kingdom of God. It's a beautiful thing. Co-workers working to the same end. Some local, others abroad. To make much of Christ. Paul talks about this in Philippians as he commends the church for meeting his need when he received their, quote, full payment and much more by the gifts they sent. He calls their their love offering a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. To provide prayer, housing, meals, notes of encouragement, and money is to participate in the noblest of endeavors. Christ church. Why wouldn't we want to be a part of this? And so may our, may our Lord continue to multiply both the sent and the senders, the supporters. May we become more like Gaius in his imitation of Christ. We imitate him as he imitates Christ. And next... John turns his attention to a a leader in the church whose heart seems to be less than pure. Diotrephus is his name. Look at verse 9. I have written something to the church, John writes, but Diotrephus, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I will come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. So it seems as if John wrote a letter to this church, but, but this guy by the name of Diotrephus decided somewhere along the way that John has no authority to do so. His letter is good for nothing. He doesn't want this letter. And he would never pass it along to the church. And Diotrephus is a, is a leader in the church, but seems to be, again, no ally of John. He offers no hospitality, and he doesn't offer any place for the speakers of the truth to stay. In fact, what's it say? He says he drives them away. He is seemingly a selfish and arrogant man who likes to, quote, put himself first. He's on his high horse, and he has zero plans of getting off. And he slanders John. And probably anyone that is in John's corner by talking, quote, wicked nonsense against them. And I find it interesting that that John never mentions that his teaching is, is riddled with theological error, but certainly his life is. If he's putting guys like John and Gaius out, his love appears to be absent in these ways, and his hospitality and humility is definitely missing. And we know from the last letter, 2 John, that it's difficult to be a fellow worker of the truth if you don't have both what? Truth and love. So Diotrephus is where, where is his love? This is a bad spot for the church to be in. To have a leader like this. In fact, it's divisive. It's dangerous. It's not gospel enhancing. And Christian leaders need to follow John's example here in this letter. With a spirit of gentleness, we must must never shy away from 
from being able to con confront others in both truth and love when the time is appropriate. We must never let such dangers that Diotrephus was bringing into the church go unchecked. And Jesus teaches, a great, teaches us a great model for Christian confrontation in Matthew 18. And what's the purpose of Christian confrontation? It's, it's a healthy, it's loving, it's to restore a brother or a sister. Never to ostracize or cast them out. Our confrontation is to be done in a healthy and loving manner. So John, Jesus teaches us, again, Matthew 18, what are we to do? We are first to go to the individual. John's first letter. But if he or she remains unrepentant, well, then we are to establish further evidence and bring in a couple other faithful Christians to confront again. And if he or she still remains unrepentant, then we are to bring it before leaders in the church. This is the process that John is beginning in this letter. And he is on his way, in fact, to help, if needed, when he meets them face to face. Again, the aim being to restore this brother. And the, the teaching point, I think, for us here is that the church is, is filled with human beings. Prone to sin. Fallible and short of perfect. And the sad reality of, of Christian conflict can be resolved through persistent, godly confrontation. That is the first step. And the second step then follows. Having applied this method from Matthew 18, we then turn our attention to imitation as John gives us the only command um, of this letter in verse 11. You can find it there. Beloved, do not imitate evil but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. And now we get our contrast to Diotrephus. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we also add our testimony. And you know that our testimony is true. We are not to imitate evil. Namely, the things Diotrephus is doing, but rather we are to imitate good. Namely, what Demetrius is doing. Unlike Diotrephus, Demetrius gets a positive report from everyone. And the truth also testifies to his goodness. He walks the walk and talks the talks. He practices what he preaches. He lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be more like Demetrius, not Diotrephus. That's the, the short summary of the sermon. Be more like Demetrius. And then John closes by telling them that he is coming to visit them. Thus it will be known who is imitating good and, and who is not, as he will see with his own eyes the truth that's before him. John writes, to close, I have much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to faith face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, every one of them. This is what the church does. How John closes this letter. It is a hospitable place where individuals are greeted and known. Every one of them. John has called those in the church children, brothers, and now here friends. What can possibly bring together men such as Gaius and John, one a Gentile and the other Jew, one likely a former pagan and the other one uh, one of the first followers of Jesus? What would motivate people from different towns, different cultures, different upbringings to welcome strangers into their homes and, and to provide resources to them? What would possess an old man like John to, to travel many miles in order to talk to these people face to face? Well, it's the peace, the love of Christ. It's the fellowship of the saints that's experienced here. It's the love of Christ made manifest, manifest among the body of believers, the body of Christ. It's men like Gaius and Demetrius who imitate good. It's women like Priscilla and Aquila who desire to see God's people thrive in the church. 
It's the good Samaritan who goes the extra mile to care for a stranger, putting his own resources and time on the line. It's Lydia who offers up her home. Be more like these people. Be more like Demetrius. Imitators of Christ. Men and women of sacrifice, of of grace and truth, of mercy and hospitality, of love and kindness. Christ didn't just greet us. He sacrificed. He died for us. He didn't just welcome us in for a time. He invites us into his home for eternity. He isn't just an acquaintance on the road. He is our friend and our brother. He is our Savior through whom we are able to see God, the Father, face to face. Be imitators of Him. All of the people we meet that are worthy of imitation are first imitators of Jesus. And so must we be. People will know us by our love and our truth. They will know us by the fruit that we bear in Christ through His Spirit. And it was sweet just to reflect back uh, of who are the Demetriuses, who are the Gaiuses in my life. Uh, Upon coming to Hershey's and reflecting over the years, I, I am reminded of some of our great imitators of Christ. And this is going to make me tear up a little bit. Examples of people to follow. I remember how welcoming Anna and Melvin were, inviting us into their home. I can still hear the encouragement of guys like Walter and Leonard, never looking down on me because I was young, stepping into leadership roles. I remember the joy of E.B. Hershey whenever he would shake my hand, excited and happy to just be in fellowship together. Or the kindness of the ladies in the retirement homes, Margaret, Anna, Dorothy, and Lorraine, all whom love to give me a snack as I go, to take home and even bring to my kids. And how Betty Hershey, whenever my family would go to visit, she would have animal crackers ready at the door to welcome us in and be hospitable. And Ethan still remembers Betty as such. And he misses Betty, he says. That's, he said that just a couple weeks ago. And goodness, I mean, I could go on. The generosity of so many of you towards me and my family. Demetrius, Gaius, like Christ. Both as a youth and now as an adult. And as I was working on this sermon, thinking about these things in particular, thinking about the great imitators we have and have had here among us, I was just sitting in the coffee shop trying not to weep. What a sweet body of believers this is. What a sweet thing it is to be part of a loving church. What imitation of Christ we have here among us. And so may we continue to endeavor to such an end. Toward one another. May we be like Gaius. May we be like Demetrius. May the Spirit continue to work in us as we look more and more like Christ each and every day in our imitation of Him. I love you all. Let's pray. God, what a sweet thing it is to be brought together in fellowship as not strangers that go about our week and then randomly come together for no reason, but I thank you that you have intentionally placed us together in geography in time, in space. As we gather here on Sunday mornings in order to ultimately lift your name high and in a manner worthy of worship as we exalt your name. And God, I pray that you would continue to just 
work in each of us individually by the power of your spirit to mold and shape us to imitate your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, more and more each day. And God, I pray that you are, as you are forming each of us individually, that you are forming us as a body as well, as a corporate body of believers, as a church together. So that all of those around us would, would recognize our imitation of you. They would feel in a tangible way the love and hospitality that we have to offer because of you offering it to us first. God, I pray that the people of this church, that we would continue to be like Demetrius, like Gaius, and ultimately like your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen.